And this video is my anti-war timeline and how I ended up being opposed to war. And uh, am I, uh, I say when I was a kid, I do, I do remember war as a child. That uh, I grew up during Vietnam, and um, I remember during the Vietnam War, every every day on the, uh, I'm not sure if it every day or every week, they would they would they would bring up a placard, and they would they would have three flags, and one flag would be um, USA, USA dead, another flag would be uh, Republic of Vietnam dead, and the um, another flag would be. Uh, the uh, Viet Cong dead, and there'd be a number by one. And the, um, of course, the Viet Cong dead would always be quite a bit larger than the American dead and the Republic of Vietnam dead. So that would be the implication would be that uh, we're winning, we're winning because their number was higher than our number. Um, that didn't happen, but that's what that's. I think that was the intention it was meant to give, or the impression it was meant to give. Um, I think another thing I remember as a child was, um, this didn't happen that often, but there was a lottery. I don't know if people, maybe people, younger people don't know this, but um, back in the 60s and early 70s, there was a lottery for every uh, birthday. And what they would do is they would, um, they would, every birthday would get a number from 1 to 365. And um, and the people who had a low number would get drafted. The people who had a high number did not get drafted. I believe was how it works. And, um, and you know, I was I was a, I was very young at the time, but I do remember being spooked by that. It was it was spooky. It was spooky the thought of you know of, of people getting drafted because their number was low. You know, and there was like a you know, there was unchangeability about it. I, that I, I think that the way it worked is that every year they redrew different numbers. So like, you know, they, they would draw like the number, you know, for your birthday in like, you know, 1968 and then 1969, it would be a different number. So you weren't necessarily, just because they drew, you know, your birthday drew a low number one year. That didn't mean that would uh, get to be your turn when you reached that age. Um, but um, that was a thing. That was the thing, you know. I remember hearing it on the radio. Um, uh, of course, you know that war ended before I got to um, before I got to high school, you know. And um, and what I what I do remember from high school though is that um, I mean I'll, I'll explain a little bit that like I'm I'm half Japanese and half Finnish, I'm mixed race. And, you know, in high school they're sort of like. There's kind of the white kids and the the Hispanic kids hanging out with each other, and you know there's maybe you know some each group if there's enough people they would form a group, but there was always the group of random other ethnicities, and I was sort of like always part of the the random other people group, you know, like I was hanged out with the random other races and other um, and other ethnicities, and um, what happened in uh, in the mid seventies was the fall of Saigon. And a lot of people left uh, Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos and they came here. They came to the USA and they came to our high school. So we would be sitting literally right next to them. And um, I, you know, and I, I would, I sort of knew these guys and I would talk to them and I just like, I just remember what Vietnam, Vietnamese kid he would like, I don't know. I don't think he was actually in the military, but he would just he would he he has stories about like you know, uh, you know shooting trees, shooting trees with machine guns, and you know fishing with hand grenades, and all, all sorts of like kind of s strange you know goofy kid stories about being in a war zone. But he didn't have it, yeah. Um, I, but I don't remember anything. He didn't convey to me anything that traumatic. Uh, I remember a friend told me that, like, um, his story, well, the story I remember hearing was that some kid told me that his mother just knew. His mother knew to leave. Like, he didn't know why or how 
or what was going on. But like she just saw the writing on the wall and she knew to get out now. And what happened was, you know, she, you know, she just, she was in a situation where she could get on one of the, just get on a normal flight out of South Vietnam and get to the USA before it got bad. So this, you know, this guy, this kid had a smart mother. She knew, she knew what the story was, you know. Um, I did. Um, I I also I knew I did know the guys from Cambodia. There were some people from Cambodia who absolutely had, you know, the Killing Field stories, literally. And I do remember someone told me, like, you know, some kid would just say, like, totally deadpan, you know, all my family is dead except me. You know, they had just. I don't know. I didn't even know. I don't think they were making that up. I think it was real um, based on other news I'd heard, but I, I didn't even know how to process it. You know, they were, they had a lot of, they had, you know, they were just, they were in a, they're sort of hard to talk to a little bit because there was a, they were sort of just getting their feel for English and mostly they were, you know, trying to make their way in, in a new country and they'd just been out of war and they've, now they're sitting in high school, you know, trying to take algebra or something, you know. Um, um, and they and they, but they didn't want to talk about the politics of it, you know. And I don't know if I was so interested in the politics of it either back then, you know. But, but I was sort of slightly intrigued just by the strangeness of it, and you know, people had that kind of experience. Um, uh, and so, and then I have another confession to make, and that is, is, is I did work at a defense contractor as a kind of an in, internship when I was at college, and um, I was I was an engineering student, and my father was um, my father was working at a defense contractor here in um, uh, in Burbank, and uh, and. Uh, and it was it was it wasn't Lockheed, but it was that kind of company, sort of Lockheed Hughes, like one of those, you know, sort of connected companies. And uh, you know, it was just like this. It was this big company, and they were just like you know, there's like guys who'd been working there for thirty years and all that stuff. And mostly, it was, you know, it's like, you know, you couldn't really tell it was a defense contractor, really. You know, you would see like. You would see military stuff. There'd be some mil ex-military guys. Like there were sort of, I think there were two kinds, there were a co different classes of employees. Like there's some of us who are sort of the science-y engineering types. And then they would they would hire like people who had been in the Navy and they would hire them to, um, you know, just, just someone there who's like had a real experience to actually, you know, work with these uh, weapons uh, to have an opinion about them and they, they and they would you know they for they were fine they just had a regular job just like us you know um and uh but and you know i i didn't even it, it mostly it's like you're sort of in that kind of environment you're kind of you're working on engineering problems you're working on very very kind of quirky very 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 drilled down specific you know um physics problems basically or or kind of uh, yeah yeah physics or engineering problems but um but it was weapons you know and there was there was literally a box a box and there was a screen and you would click on you click a little button like who do i want to attack and you'd like literally click on it with a little light pen and you'd turn the key and push the button and uh of course there were, there were no weapons connected to anything but we did work on stuff that was pretty clearly military there and i don't remember thinking that much of it at the time i do i did ask a guy like like you know would this ever be used in a war but i don't, I don't remember i remember asking but i don't remember anybody responding to that you know i i think you know people you know people people make the accommodations they have to to make you know you sort of come to understand you do what you have to do to get your job done basically you know um and that was um that was only that was only when i was uh intern basically so i never worked a defense contractor after college i did i did an interview with the hughes aircraft 
power supply. They had a group making power supplies and they were all working on these analog power supplies. And I interviewed with them, but I didn't I ended up going a different path and I ended up working on games instead, which I think, which, which, and I wanted to do games for some, uh, I, I didn't want to deal with security clearances and all that. Cause I was sort of navigating the kind of trans future and all that and trying to figure that out at that time too. And I didn't want to deal with like, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know. Like, I think, yeah, dealing with, yeah, security clearance, no. I didn't want to do that. So I, I, that's that's a large reason. That's a reason why I went into games at the time. And also, I was, I was, it was just kind of fun, and it was kind of cool and new and exciting at the time. But anyway, um, and, uh, you know, but, and I would say the next thing I remember, like, I think everybody's old enough remembers 9-11 and all that, you know? I think we, a lot of us have the same experience of, just you know of 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 being glued to the tv of just you know of like watching this thing happen and it would just be like oh my god you know it seemed it seemed it was intense and it did feel like you know, something different is happening here you know so i i do remember that um I was in Berkeley though at the time, so I, you know I was in New York. It, so for me, it was mostly a, a media event. That nothing, I mean, the main difference was the uh, the air fl air flights shut down. So, but you know, but my life sort of continued on. I I did go through that you know that kind of obsessively watching news phase for a while, which I think a lot of people have been doing recently. Which, and I did I did sort of learn to kind of turn it off also you know so to stop you know not to stay glued to cnn endlessly that it's not healthy so i did learn to turn that off um i would say for me there was there's a, there's kind of a different one thing that's different about me is that i, I after 9 11 the usa came down pretty hard on the muslims in the usa at least that was my impression and you know and I'm not Muslim, and I didn't re I didn't have any Muslim friends at the time, but but it sort of triggered something in me a little bit, and that is that like like I'm half Japanese, and like my father was in interned during World War II. My father and grand his parents and his uh, sister and baby brother were in uh, interned in camps during World War II. So I, I felt kind of a sympathetic kind of like shared al enemy alien experience perhaps a little bit. And I just felt like um, something about this did not sit right with me. I was, I was concerned. Um, I was, I was, um, so I, I did get interested in that stuff though. And I was, I was pretty interested in the uh, Afghanistan war that followed. Um, uh, there was, it's hard to get any, Afghanistan's always been pretty opaque. It's hard to figure out what's going on there. There are, there are sources from Afghanistan and people who do post from there, but uh, they weren't, there's, there's, there weren't a lot of them back then. It was a hard place to get any ideas out of, of what was really going on. But um I did end up. I did find a forum with a lot of Pakistani guys, and um, I would say one thing about uh, you know, if you want to go, want to know what's going on in a Muslim country, and you're an English speaker, like Pakistan is is the most transparent place because because they all speak English. They all speak really good English, and a lot of the, a lot of the debate is in English in Pakistan. So you can sort of, you know, you could, there was a lot of ideas sort of bouncing around, you know, at that time. And you could sort of read them, discuss that in their own language, you know. And my, feel, my sense with a lot of other countries is that, you know, that there's, there's a, there's like, there's, there's two voices, you know, that they say one thing in their own native language and then, in, but in the English, translations of their own news they, they, they it's the, the it's presented a little differently but with the pakistanis you can sort of you can sort of see what they're saying exactly um um so yeah and so so by the time the um 
the Iraq war came along, I think I was, I was pretty clued in at the time. And, you know, I, I was, I knew like Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. I'm just saying that, you know, this was like a fact. <laughs> Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with 9-11. And there were no mass, <laughs> there were no weapons of mass destruction. It was all a lie, you know. So I mean, I knew, I knew, I knew at the start of that that this was a bad idea. And but it, you know, it's like watching a train wreck, and it and it's impossible, not. It became hard not to watch in a way, just how it went bad, and then it went bad, and then it went bad some more, you know. Um, I remember, I think the point, when it was clear to when it was going to go horribly bad when those contractors got killed in Fallujah. That's what I remember. And, um, and I remember, I remember like debate, I would like debate people online in the USA, but, you know, you know, nothing, you know, nothing, nothing changes with that, you know, and. After Iraq, you know, there the wars kept coming, and I would just watch it happen. And you know, you you would argue with people or something, but uh, nothing would change much, J just more. And um, I think was something did change. One thing I did, I know, I'm not sure if any, maybe so much, maybe this is my just my perception, or maybe this is real. But uh, what seemed to change to me between 2000 and the 2010s is that just Arabs got better at English. Like in the early 2000s, you know, like it was the Arab world was very opaque to me, like uh, like in, in the 2000s. But if it's but by by the late two, 2010s, there is a lot of people who were quite fluent at English, you know, and you could just chat to them on Facebook or Twitter or something like that. And, um, or Facebook. Yeah. yeah like, and they would be like, you know, they, um, so yeah, you can find somebody in Gaza or Yemen or Syria or something like that. Um, and I sort of, I gave up yelling at Americans about this and I just started, um, talking more to the people, who were there and who were experiencing it. And, um, and, and I, mean, I think partially because I'm, you know, I'm kind of an untouchable person myself, you know, I'm like, you know what I mean? The, I, I don't, I don't have the, like, you know, I don't have the fear of guilt by association, or maybe I should be afraid of that, but I'm not, I don't, I don't, I'm not afraid of associating with anybody, you know, I, and I never hide, hid the trans thing, and I, I never brought it up. I have no idea what anybody thought, but th that partially that's how the best way to navigate this, too, is just you don't, don't think about what other people are saying until they say something, you know? So it seemed to go fine, except for, like, they were, it was a horror. And mostly these people, they, you know, they were just, you know, they were, they were just right about their own life. Um... A lot, of, a lot of looking to collect money, um, but I never, I never gave money to anybody, and and I, I think it's it's one of those things that there are scammers out there, uh, so it's hard to know who's real. And also, I believe it's uh, legally dangerous that you know you could if you send some money to somebody, it could, you know, who knows, who knows what the government's gonna think? It could go bad, you know, so you could end up in a very bad place. So I. I knew enough never send money to anybody. Um, but uh, I would say the best accounts, the best, the best people to, to follow were just people who just shared, you know, the, the, the people who are the best were the, were the ones who are just talking about food and their weddings and their babies and all this kind of stuff. I mean, that's, a, that's in a way, that's how I would, partially how I would tell who was real. Like anybody, like people are just, they, they you know, they, they live in a war zone, but they still are just living their normal life. And, um, and like, you know, and you would see, yeah, you'd see their, you know, you'd see a picture of the wedding or something like that. And you'd, you'd comment on that and it would all be chill. But, um, 
sometimes the bombs did come and the war did come and they did share photos and um and after f following this for a while you know i i, st I start you know you, i started to get a feel for what the real versus the bogus photos are you know and sometimes i share myself and maybe i made a few mistakes but you know i i got i i sort of like had some ways of trying to figure out what was real versus what were what was fake um if you watch enough of this what happens is um you just start to see the same photos over and over again. So what will happen is, you know, like you watch it, someone will show something and they say this is in Syrian, but like, oh, no, wait a bit. That was from Gaza like a few years back. So you, you sort of, if you, if you watch it enough, you can sort of remember these things. And also um, uh, reverse image search is pretty useful nowadays for tr trying to track down at least the, or find things that are old um, and bogus. But you know, but sometimes if you if you get to know somebody and they share a photo, they're pretty much you're pretty sure they're real. Um, though even like them, most of the, sh the photos are shared even among the people over there, and uh, some of these could be pretty harrowing. And uh, I think there's one one I remember in particular. There was I think it was cast lead, and it was I think it was a ice cream freezer, like one of those like ice cream freezers meant to like you know to you know, keep your ice cream cones in that you're serving. And it was filled with bodies of dead children, you know. So, uh, so it's, yeah, it can be not, it can be unpleasant to look at, but, and it's not all that, but that's definitely part of it, you know. Um, and, um, you know, I never had that many followers, but I had some, and I had people I knew, and, um, Sometimes I find somebody else, like you know, you like so sort of following like the Yemen war or something like that. And you find somebody else who's like, I would find some other account of somebody who's like posting, uh, you know, news, you know, or posting like, yeah, the sadness of the horrible Yemen war and like getting one like or no likes. And then I'd like friend them and try to keep up on what they're doing. Um, and and I think mostly I'm ignored, but see, every once in a while I'd see somebody I knew from real life start sharing, like I'd be sharing Yemen photos or things about the Yemen war, and then I'd see them like post some stuff about the Yemen or Gaza also. So I maybe mean, they picked it up for me, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. I don't think I opened any eyes, but many eyes, but I, I think it happened a few times. Um, and sometimes people would want to help, you know, but um, but like I've been following stuff a while and my thought was always, you know, don't go, don't go, don't ever go to a country at war ever is kind of my, my, my take on this. And especially if you don't speak the language, don't go to a place at war where you do not speak the language. It's like you, there are people who have gotten killed doing this. It's not good. And, but, and so like, as far as me, like, I'm not going to stop this. I'm not going to stop this. And it's going to go on no matter what I do. Um, and it's how it goes. Um, I say I, recently I've sort of last Last few months, I would say I, I've just backed off of Facebook and Twitter and all that. I just, uh, partially just to get my just get time to clear my own mind out and focus on my own stuff. I think um, I think war is is toxic, and you have to. Uh, I do see people they go. It you know the people people. People who are, you know, part of, if you're part of the war or if you're opposed to war and they like spend too much time on it, they, they can go pretty crazy and they can have a lot of, you know, just they can, it can just make you sick. If you follow too much of this, it just can make you sick. It can hurt your body literally because you're just, you could just, because you can't do anything about it and it happens but it's also kind of important and maybe we should be looking at it. So you're conflicted and it, it can, it can hurt you. So I sort of, I sort of backed off a little bit. I backed off a lot, you know, and, um, 
I would say, um, so I think, but I, you know, I have said, I had some thoughts about this, you know, and like, and like, and what can you do? You know, what, what's the best, what's the best way to like address something like this? And, um, I'm at the point now where I'm like, the, well, I feel like debating or arguing with people is pointless. And if you debate somebody, largely they just, you just reinforce their opinion and they just dig in deeper. But, um, but what, I, but I think there are things that can get to people that aren't debate and uh, like art and music and, you know, you, you could you could share someone in like Gaza or in Yemen, you show their baby pictures or like you show them their their paintings or pictures of nature or their wedding pictures. Um, so food, I think you can't share food on the Internet, but I, what I think someone what is it? Uh, the conflict kitchen. I, we, I, we're all under quarantine. And so it's, I'm sure that's not running anymore. But uh, I think that they had a that's a brilliant idea that you serve the food of the place that's at war. And I think I think that's the kind of thing that gets to people. That that the the, the weakest link in the endless wars is it's not ideology, but it's it's the dehumanization that the people are people are human, you know, and it's like it's an undeniable truth. And it doesn't take much to break through the dehumanization. You just see a bit, you know, you see a hint of like, oh, someone paints a picture and then then you go, oh, that's that's a real person. And then it changes. Once you make that leap, I think a lot changes right with that, you know. Anyway, that's my story. And uh, thank you for watching and getting to the end. I'm going to shut this off.